Good morning, and a big thank you for our federal and state, regional, local partners, as well as many distinguished guests for lending your valuable time here today and your expertise as we come together and try to shape Vermont's future. I'm Josh Hanford. I'm the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development, at least for a few more weeks. Um, many of you already know that after a fairly lengthy career in state government, over 18 years with the department, uh, I've accepted a new role with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to be their director of intergovernmental relations. And it's, um, you know, it, it, it's been quite the journey. Throughout my time at the department, it's been an honor and privilege to collaborate with some of the most talented individuals in our state, most of you in this room. You know, as I embark on this new exciting chapter, I, I carry a lot of these experiences and lessons with me. Uh, a lot of friendships and relationships that were forged over that period. And I might be biased, but I think some of the best, some of the best and brightest in the state uh, serve at ACCD. Uh, you know, while, while commissioner, I watched the agency surmount many obstacles, initiate and deliver essential policy changes, funding, programs, and it consistently exceeded the limits of what I thought was possible. I want to give a, a special thanks to the collective expertise, the dedication, creativity, and collaborative spirit that enables the community planning and revitalization team here today. They, they hit well above their weight, so please stand up, those CPNR folks. Stay, stay standing up. <laughs> Keep standing up. In fact, if there's any former or current DHCD staff in the room, also please stand up. It's a few. How about any former ACCD staff? I know there's a few. So thank you. It's been a pleasure and honor to work with you. And as I leave, I want to extend you know, the deepest gratitude to each of you for your unwavering support, your dedication, guidance, and friendship. It really has meant a lot and seemed like a second family. Rest assured, even as I transition to a different role, my strong commitment to advancing the quality of life in Vermont remains steadfast. While my approach will change from top down to bottom up, my dedication to Vermonters and the ideals we all share in this room will not. I'm generally enthusiastic about the opportunities ahead and eagerly anticipate today's conversation on ways to strengthen Vermont's communities. My shift to work directly with Vermont's communities and this conversation about the future of Vermont's designation programs couldn't have more overlap or be more timely. This significant work was initiated by the legislature's foresight and allocating funds to bring natural experts to assist us in renewing and enhancing our state's de uh, designation programs. So I want to offer a thanks to all the legislators in the room. I know there's many of them for uh, enabling this and, and thinking ahead to what's next. I'd also like to give a special thanks to the downtown board members who commit their time and expertise every month to maintaining Vermont's historic development patterns. I've served as the chair of the downtown board for the last five years and I can tell you this group works very, very hard behind the scenes. Hours of application review, short turnarounds. And so I also want to uh, have them stand up, any of the board members that are here. I'm, I know there's several. And a special round of applause goes to Mike McDonough from Bennington, who's been on this board since its inception in 1991. I don't think he's missed more than one or two meetings in all those years, so thank you. <laughs> Reviewing the state's designation programs beginning long before the July rains, flooded downtowns and villages, washed out roads and bridges, submerged homes and businesses, and halted commerce in many of our communities. The floods washed away personal possessions and the livelihoods of too many Vermonters. Families have been separated from their communities and daily routines upended. The stress and anxiety brought about by these events can't be underestimated. From downtowns and village center businesses, the impacts range from the cost of building repairs to service disruptions, closures, inability to transport goods and services, temporary or permanent unemployment for workers. 
the broader economic impacts have a crippling effect on the tax base when you add in the infrastructure repairs that, that need to come to bear. You know, I witnessed this with Irene in my town at the time of Rochester and being cut off for a week and saw how that really threw the town for quite a loop for a number of years. And it just seems to keep happening. Step by step, we've made incredible progress and have showcased how Vermont strong, resourcefulness, self-reliance, and a sense of community spirit, again, is alive. While Vermont faces many climate risks from high heat, drought, flooding still remains our most significant and costly economic threat. You can look at the data and years after Irene, I still served on the Hazard Mitigation Grant Selection Committee, the state's um, uh, uh, assessment of our vulnerabilities and flooding by far is our most, cost, our most costly natural disaster year after year. The ripple effects and damages to individuals, businesses, homes, roads, utilities extend throughout the local, regional, and state economies. While climate adaption and resiliency were always part of the scope of work, I want to also express a special thanks to the Agency of Natural Resources and their Climate Action Office for their leadership and contributions to this crucial conversation. They kicked in some extra funding to really explore this as part of the designations going forward. And that just happened a few days after the floods for, for this deeper dive of rebuilding with climate change in mind, while still balancing the importance of what we love about Vermont, preserving our working lands, our floodplains, our open spaces, and the character of our historic centers. So much of what we cherish about Vermont is shaped by the thoughtful development patterns. Vibrant villages and downtowns, abundant agriculture, working lands, robust network of forests and recreational assets, for over 25 years, the Vermont State Designation Program have left their mark on nearly 260 municipalities. The Designation Programs encompass five programs, village centers, downtowns, neighborhood development areas, growth centers, and new town centers. These programs have provided vital benefits, such as tax incentives, grant funding, technical assistance, regulatory relief to help villages and downtowns thrive across the state. We have so many success stories from our smallest villages like Hancock to our larger downtowns like St. Johnsbury. Their, their work and their vibrancy stand as a testament to the positive impacts of this program. Yet, we must acknowledge that many of our villages, many of our communities are built near the water, on the water, and face increased risks and challenges. This demands that we ask some hard questions. How will we adapt to climate change? the intense housing pressure, our evolving demographics and equity needs, what will Vermont look like in 25 years from now? Today, we have a unique opportunity to contribute to this conversation so that in 25 years, when we or our children or grandchildren look back and wonder how and why Vermont changed so much or why it didn't change enough from the place we know and love today, it's what we're here for to discuss and talk about. So here are some of the questions we might explore today that guide this conversation. How can we enhance accessibility and address equity barriers for diverse communities and users of the designation program? How can we better align programs with regional plans and future land use maps? How can we modernize, simplify, and streamline the administration to increase program efficiency? How can we enhance the program's ability to address emerging Vermont priorities, such as housing, climate change, transportation demands and changes, equitable state investment, and more. We welcome all of your lived experiences and big ideas for the state designation program. We invite you to share your feedback, your concerns, your dreams, what you think will help shape Vermont's future, one village and one downtown at a time. With your support, I'm confident Vermont will take the steps to ensure our communities, businesses, and people can quickly bounce back and not break when the next disaster strikes. Together, we'll continue to build a bright future for Vermont, and I'm grateful for the privilege of having played a small part in this journey. And I wanna thank you all for being here today. I think almost know more than half of the room and have worked with you, and that's been a privilege. Um, now's the time where we roll up our sleeves, mine are already up, and we get to work. And so I wanna um, invite our, our colleagues up today, and I'm excited to introduce our consultant team 
led by Smart Growth America and Community Workshop. Smart Growth America, as many know, is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing sustainable, equitable development, specifically promoting better connectivity between land use and transportation. We're delighted to have their mission-driven approach and their knowledge of nation's best practices and policies on our team. Community Workshop is a Vermont-based consulting firm specializing in creative community engagement, planning, placemaking, design, and facilitation. Community Workshop has led our engagement efforts and has done a fantastic job designing an engagement strategy for this project, accumulating <laughs> in today's event. And so without further ado, I want to uh, invite uh, Catherine from Smart Growth America to come up and get us kicked off. And just thank you for being here and being part of this. Vermont's future depends on you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Commissioner Hanford, and thank you to the entire DHCD team for all your collaboration and commitment to this project. And I have to also recognize this is a really incredible group of state leaders. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we feel so lucky to have your expertise, your perspectives, and your energy to collaborate with all of us to determine strategies to take the designation programs to the next level. My name is Catherine Burgess, and I lead the land use and development team at Smart Growth America. As you've heard, Smart Growth America is a national nonprofit focused on sustainable, equitable development. And our North Star is a country where no matter who you are or where you live, you can enjoy living in a place which is healthy, prosperous, and resilient. And on the ground, we envision these places to include housing of a range of types and costs, good transportation choices, easy access to jobs, civic facilities, and shopping without reliance on a car. And this is a vision that is really in line with the potential and the goals of the designation programs. But unfortunately, it's countered a standard development practice across most of the US, which typically favors single family residential and separated commercial and institutional uses. So our organization works nationally, but I'm especially excited on a personal level to be a part of this project because I live in Montpelier. We've also greatly enjoyed partnering with Community Workshop, which as you've heard has led our creative and uh, exciting engagement strategy culminating in today's event. So first, before we get started, I wanna make sure that you're aware of everyone on the team, all of whom are here to be a resource to you today, really excited to share more about this work and to also get involved in the collaborative discussions. And can folks on the team stand up, please? You know, our core team includes uh, Jerry Mincer, who's back by the resource table. She has managed the project adeptly with many moving parts and a quick timeline. Our research director, Michael Rodriguez, who you'll hear from next, who designed the research strategy to assess the impact of the designation program so far. And Rebecca Stone, uh, who has led the community and stakeholder engagement process. We also have a group of key advisors who brought a real depth of knowledge, both of national state policy best practices and of uh, planning here in Vermont. This includes Chris Zimmerman, who's uh, up in the very back, uh, who is a longtime Smart Growth America staffer, who also was an elected official in Arlington, Virginia, known nationally for its smart growth policies. We've been joined, with, for, by, joined by two Vermont-based planners as advisors, Sharon Murray, as well as Faith Inglesrud, who had a long tenure at DHCD and knows the designation programs extremely well. Finally, we also have a pro bono advisor, Jim Tischler, a redevelopment leader in Michigan who spent time practicing in St. Albans and got to know the designation programs then. Now, before we begin, it's really important to ground our discussion in where we are and the many generations before us. So, Please join me in reflecting and acknowledging the following about Vermont. First, we acknowledge the traditional unceded homeland of the Western Abenaki people. We acknowledge the home heritage and history of Vermont, which is especially relevant to us today, given the designation program's focus on historic preservation. We need to acknowledge that none of these things are equitable or equal and that historic and current racism and other barriers have, presented, have prevented equitable land ownership and access, which are key to wealth building and generational opportunity. And finally, thanks to climate change, Vermont is warmer and wetter. And in the opening remarks, uh, you know, we heard some reflections on the traumatic and damaging events of this summer. And so we must acknowledge the increase in climate impacts facing Vermont and Vermonters as well as the rest of the country.
So with that grounding, we're eager to move into today's project and agenda and to give you a quick overview into the work that we have been doing over the past few months and to set the stage to get your input today. So reflecting on both the nature of Vermont and the many start challenges before us, you know, we're looking at the designation programs and what the opportunities are to improve and reform these programs to effectively meet state goals. So first I have to acknowledge that coming from the national perspective, we really see these programs as unique nationally as models of how to encourage compact, vibrant settlements which foster local character and economic development opportunity and preserve the broader landscape. You know, we were really excited as an organization to have the opportunity to um, assess and learn from this program because it's unique nationally. And we really think that this reform presents the opportunity to take it to the next level. Notably, we think it presents a fantastic opportunity to develop strategies to, uh, to address some of Vermont and the country's most pressing challenges. This includes the housing access crisis and inequitable access to housing and the climate crisis. So I'll start with a very high level overview of the designation programs as they stand today, recognizing that within this room we have a range of amounts of exposure to the program. Some folks work on this program day in and day out. Others are more familiar with it at a high level. Our team's here to be a resource to you during the interactive portions of today, and we also have a large team from DHCD here, which of course knows these programs intimately. So I think it's incredibly important to start by acknowledging that this is a program that has been around for about 25 years, and it has grown and expanded over time. And all of these expansions have occurred you know, on account of different goals and the different contexts um, of, di of the different points in time at which the program grew. All of these programs seek to advance smart growth, but at different scales, in different contexts, and with different types of tools available. So first I'll start with the downtown designation program, which is probably the program that the most folks are familiar with, and we have heard the DHCD describe it as the top shelf of the designations. So there are 24 downtowns located across the state, believe in just about every county aside from Grand Island, Essex. So this program has been extremely successful in terms of economic development, revitalization, and has been a key part of the redevelopment story of a number of towns such as Bristol. Key challenges, however, for the downtown designation include establishing boundaries and also the required participation of a downtown nonprofit, which can present capacity challenges for smaller communities. Next, you have the Village Center program, which is by far the most prolific, with over 230 village centers involved. This is the easiest designation to get, but the benefits are the most limited. And notably, we've heard the most uh, positive feedback about the tax credits. Next, new town centers were established to support communities which lacked a downtown to establish a new mixed-use walkable center. And this is the highest capacity program for local engagement because it requires a big vision, infrastructure planning, and also you know, a large site to potentially deliver this vision. And you know, there's only three across the state. South Burlington has um, made the most progress with this. Then the final two programs are considered add-on designations. They are for communities which already have one of the prior three designations. So first there's the neighborhood development area, which is an add-on for infill and housing to encourage housing in close proximity to a traditional center. This is the fastest growing of the designation types, and it's the most recent program. Then finally, there's the growth center designation, which is intended for planned growth in close proximity to a center to reduce sprawl. And this can include other types of uses which are not found in a traditional downtown, such as large scale institutional, potentially industrial, and uh, there are six growth centers across the state. So all of these um, types of designations offer different benefits and the DHCD team ably advises uh, municipalities and communities regarding the, you know, the eligibility and the different combinations of benefits. As I mentioned earlier, by far, you know, we've heard um, rave reviews about the tax credit opportunities. Also, a lot of positive feedback about access to the downtown transportation fund in order to improve transportation options. You'll also see a wide range of other types of benefits from fee reductions and exemption of land gains tax to Act 250 benefits, which um, offer arguably the highest potential for impact. So of course, the Act 250 benefits you know, present the opportunity to promote and support housing development. And our team has spent the past few months intimately getting to know the designation programs. And we're aware you know, of the many intricacies, complexities, and uh, intersections with Act 250. Also, you know, uh, 
high, and it's of course highly relevant to look at the potential to re of reform to Act 250 as well. Notably, we heard very positive feedback about the 50% fee reduction in neighborhood development areas. Pictured is Winooski, cited as a, a success story in terms of the form-based code and the, um, the Act 250 benefits which uh, supported new multifamily development. So where are we now? We're now at a really opportune moment to revisit these programs and their purpose and determine whether they're meeting state goals. And it's also exciting because the state has 25 years of a body of work and this complex portfolio to learn from and to assess. And so we see today's event as an opportunity to step back and to think about the goals and how these programs can more effectively meet them and be more effectively designed both to achieve some of these, these big picture goals we've discussed and to provide a smoother experience for users. You know, it can't be underestimated um, how, what an, uh, uh, the increase of capacity that is required to deal with a program which is now, you know, some have described it as more unwieldy. So, you know, we're both looking at the big picture and uh, what the opportunities are to um, make it every day more user friendly. So I'll quickly share some framing thoughts before you hear a more data-driven analysis from our research director, Michael. We, uh, having gotten to know the programs and spent a lot of time speaking with stakeholders this summer, culminating in today's event, two topics really rose to the top. The first is the housing access crisis. And we're at a moment when the state team is ready for reform of these programs, but more importantly, we're at a point where reform is desperately needed. We have to recognize the current housing access crisis in the state and the potential for designated areas to play a key role in producing more housing which is well located for quality of life and reduced reliance on cars. And without producing more housing, designated areas run the risk of becoming increasingly expensive and inaccessible, especially to households that could really benefit from having reduced transportation costs. And evidence of the housing crisis, access crisis is almost everywhere we look in the state. I know many folks in the room are leaders on this topic and you know, authored some of the analyses that we read as we began this project. I think everyone's aware that the cost of housing has skyrocketed and a number of tragic statistics show the stark divide in the small state, notably the high homelessness rate, the low vacancy rate, and the problematic racial homeownership gap. A few quick illustrations are here, and again, you'll hear more from Michael in his remarks. Um, we have both at left a uh, depiction from the House, uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency of the recent rise in median primary home sales prices, which again has skyrocketed since 2019. And then at right, uh, you see an analysis from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, uh, which puts together a state-by-state -state analysis each year um, and showing how this housing access crisis is hitting low-income households the hardest. And you know, their analysis found that more than 87% of extremely low-income households are cost burdened in the state. But this is a daunting challenge, but we feel that the designation reform is really poised to contribute to addressing this. It's an opportune moment given the recent passage of S-100, given investments across the state in bylaw modernization, and the current level of political will after the floods. And with that, I'll share the second big theme that has really uh, risen to the top in all of our analysis as we've gotten to know the designation programs. You know, we see them as really having the potential to support Vermonters in addressing the climate crisis. And since those tragic floods, there is an increased awareness of and commitment to resilient building, and rebu rebuilding is already underway for many damaged homes and businesses. So we know that flood events like this will continue to be more frequent and more intense, and unfortunately that low-income Vermonters stand to lose the, lose the most given the burdensome cost. We think that policy must address this to support safer rebuilding, and direct future housing and growth out of harm's way as well. So we hope to work with you today to address many of the tensions between supporting safer development in beloved downtowns. And as you'll hear from Michael, many of these designations are located in vulnerable areas. That's um, you know easy to come to that conclusion, knowing the number of historic communities on riverfronts. And many are at risk due to their location. So talking about that tension between supporting safer development in beloved locations and encouraging safe future growth. And we also know that flooding is one of only many climate impacts which will impact Vermonters and designated areas in coming years. So we're eager to brainstorm with you about solutions, how the designation program can address the climate crisis through both mitigation and adaptation. And you know, historically by focusing on denser development that reduces reliance on cars, you know, in their DNA, the, the designation program is already developing strategies to reduce emissions. 
So let's also look at strategies for adaptation, how to direct development to more prepared sites, and how to ensure more prepared approaches in historic centers. And the image at right is of the Montpelier Transit Center, which was you know, lauded as being an example of new construction that fared relatively well during the flood. In this case, there's a pretty uh, flood-ready ground floor use, and then the housing is located above. So thank you again for listening to kind of some of our big picture findings and goals for today. I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Michael briefly uh, in a moment and to also walk you through what we're here to accomplish and what to expect. You have agendas on, our tab on the tables, so you'll see after starting with the grounding in our assessment, we'll move into two different deep dives, one before lunch and one after lunch. Keep in mind that we're gonna start with defining key outcomes, talking about the purpose and scope, and thinking about the places that we hope to see the designation programs impact. And then in the afternoon, we're gonna roll up our sleeves. We've already heard at least one of our attendees has his sleeves rolled up already, and look at opportunities for reform and designing those solutions. To remind you, remind you where we are in this process, we are about halfway through what has been a really rapid fire project. We started in May, did some pretty significant research and planning for the whole process, and then spent the summer with both a deep dive evaluation and as our stakeholder engagement process, which then brought us to here today for the statewide workshop. After the workshop, we'll be developing recommendations, which should be ready in draft form in late October. Final report will be ready by the end of the calendar year with the goal that everything is ready for the next legislative session. So again, it's been a quick project, but we're really thrilled with the opportunity for impact and are really excited to leverage all of your knowledge um, and passion for this topic and for Vermont communities here today. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague and our director of research, Michael Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Michael. Yep, no problem. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as resident data guy and economist here, I get the great privilege of presenting a lot of charts and graphs and then hoping that your eyes don't gloss over. But I have a feeling a lot of you like this kind of stuff, so I think I'm, I'm in good kindred spirits here. Uh, this morning, I want to talk in detail about the program evaluations. Very specifically, this was a program evaluation that we're doing and we've been doing and continue to be doing. And in the 20 or so minutes I have with you, to go over specifically three things I hope I accomplish by the end of this, conveying what our findings are out of this. So first I wanna explain what our method was and the actual process of what it is that we did. Uh, I wanna go over two very important topical themes. I think that Catherine uh, previewed some of them. And then overall talk about our findings of the pro- Oh, is the mic not? Yeah. All right. I should know better. I have a fancy mic in my, in my home. So I want to talk about four of the key program evaluation findings that we, ha that we have, at least for the purposes of this morning, as we continue to do this project. So here's some of the steps of the process. Looks a little bit like the slide we had before. But the point here is that we spoke to many state officials and many people at the HCD and throughout the communities. We reviewed program state documents, so a lot of document analysis that we actually did, digging through the actual language there. And here we're moving towards the end of the process. As you see in my slides, I'm gonna have some quotes here, I wanna be clear. The quotes we have throughout here are not my quotes or team's quotes, they're the quotes of folks that we heard say things throughout our interviews or throughout our uh, surveys. Now, here's some key highlights, again, in the actual methodology, mostly some stats of what we did. You can find the website here. And I want to talk that many of the people in the, are in this room who we spoke with, so thank you for bearing with us throughout many interviews. And we had a chance for four online surveys, talked with over 100 respondents uh, throughout those surveys, and we continue to do these interviews and have these surveys a uh, bit open. Now talking about the designation program itself, we had some other maps, so here's one version of the map. It's very small to see, right, because it's a whole state. These designation areas are a little small, but 277 of them by the latest version of your GIS map, covering a bit over 27,000 acres. One key point, that 5.7% of land, of your developed land, is categorized as a designation area. This 
echoes some of findings that we have to plug one of our reports called Foot Traffic Ahead at Smart Growth America, where we look at walkable urban places in metropolitan America. We generally find that about two to 5% of a metro area's landmass is what we would call walkable urban place. So this matches in terms of scale with that. And the programs mapping wise are a little bit different when you zoom in. Specifically, we have overlaps. One town or community or municipality could have more than one of these, and this here is Burlington. Just to show you some of the complexities, these come from the DHCD's map itself. Here's another one of your communities just to illustrate exactly what it is that's going on here. And we got to do great research, and no good research is done without research questions. These were the four broad areas of research questions, or four research questions we have over four broad areas. First, we wanted to focus on the administrative processes. So what is it about the actual process itself that can hinder or advance the actual success of the program? We wanted to identify some of the conditions for success. What is working or what might be working in the future? What you might change? On number three, what are some of those program benefits and incentives that are working or not working? How are they aligned? Of course, all these questions are cross-tabulating. They all have little arrows going towards one another. Catherine talked a lot of the specific program benefits, but our focus is how do those program benefits advance statewide goals? In number four, the current and the emerging priorities. What are your state's priorities? What should the state's priorities be going forward for a successful program? So two themes, two themes that emerged that we want to talk about this morning. We had several themes that emerged. I want to be clear there. These are just the two that I want to talk about in the short time we have today. And Russell, these aren't the only ones, but we heard a lot about housing, 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 housing. So I'd be remiss to not mention that this is a large problem that we heard and a large area that we would like uh, this program to advance in terms of housing affordability and so on. And then secondly, the issue of climate. Uh, we heard a lot about that. It's very topical, so it's natural that we're gonna uh, discuss some of that. And the housing question, going right into it, number one. We heard about whether the designation program is doing much about housing or even what the state's strategy is and how this program might fit into that state strategy such that it is there some of the outcomes that we bothered to measure, because again, we looked at a lot of data, a lot, uh, and this coming from Zillow, these are your Zillow home value index prices. They do track with your median sales prices, but to give you a sense of scale, uh, we have about 3.9% housing growth from this period about 2010 to 2019. There is a bit of a bit break point that I noticed statistically at about the pandemic. So this might not be a surprise to many of you who I've talked to. So starting at that point, housing prices started to increase about 10 to 11%. This is both a nationwide trend. We see this in a lot of metropolitan areas and across the country, but also very specifically hitting Vermont pretty hard in terms of your housing costs. And we heard it in terms of people said words like housing. So when we ask folks, what are the top goals for your program? That's what this shows. This isn't just me making up a word cloud. This is actually words that came out of a survey. So when we see housing pop up that large, I get the idea that you think, broadly speaking, housing is pretty important. There's a lot of other themes, and a lot of these other themes are going to be discussed in the report, but to illustrate and to emphasize that housing is pretty important here. And so what's the state really doing about housing? Especially since housing, of course, is an important part of your overall equity goals, when we look at that in particular. So this is your supply growth. I want to point out that your state goals are 802 people by 2035 and 305,000 non-seasonal units by that year, so by 2035. Uh, that's just to meet the overall workforce needs of your state. Well, so here's supply growth. Pre-pandemic specifically, because I don't want to lose sight of uh, specific pandemic trends in supply, it's a bit funky, but if you just want to know, Housing supply did go down during the pandemic period by about 0.6%. Most of these numbers invert a little bit, but I wanna focus on long-term trends. So there's a specific reason why, why I keep it there. And we see that village centers are the largest by number. 
but they've declined by multifamily units. And the new town centers are where we see the growth of supply most rapidly. But these numbers, folks, I'm, I'm going to mention as an economist, they're pretty low. These are not high growth numbers. Usually in a community or metropolitan area or state that's growing rapidly or trying to achieve a, a pretty aggressive housing target, that number tends to be higher than 2%, at least higher than about 1.5%. Effectively, you want to track with population and job growth, whatever you'd like that to be. So if we zoom in, here's zooming in on everything else, to note that these rates, state housing, at these rates, state housing goals really can't be met when you just kind of do the math. And this is an important equity issue. For example, just 20% of black households in Vermont actually own their own home. When you calculate what that number actually means, that's actually 450, 450 uh, black households in the state that actually own their, their home. So what we see in the data and what we hear throughout the community is an issue with housing. We heard it loud and clear, and it's especially there evident with housing and supply. And so the second big, biggest issue we hear, no surprise, uh, climate and resilience. And of course, the major events have underscored this. We, we talked about that. And I have a little bit of data on this when it comes to the designation programs. So here's some of the flood data about your designation programs. So what we did here is we took the FEMA flood maps and identified for your designation programs how much of the designation areas are inside the FEMA flood maps. So about less than 8%, just about 8% of your designated areas are in the 100-year flood zone. And about two-thirds of them in total are in what we would call the 500-year uh, flood. But it's important to note that that 500-year flood mark was surpassed in the most recent floods in certain areas in terms of the high water mark. If we drill down, which is not on this slide, but so that you know, the highest risk of flood is in the downtown zones. They have about 21% of their land is in the 100-year flood and about 71% in the 500. Uh, so of course this makes sense in a way. We like to build cities near water. That's a natural human endeavor. Um, so we should note that, but it's an important thing to know where your areas are. But flooding is not the only hazard we want to point this out. This is from your state, from the Department of Safety and uh, Public Safety, and your hazard risk scores. So when the Department of Public Safety puts together, these are weighted scores of what some of the most important risks in the state are. They vary from everything from fluvial erosion to ice, drought, infectious disease, and so on. So flood is in there in terms of inundation flood, number two. Uh, related to flu fluvial erosion. Again, this is fr from your state data from Department of Public Safety. On a related note, though, as part of the broader theme of climate and environmental stewardship, your state is committed to agricultural preservation. This was one of the things we were mandated to look at and we think is pretty important. So we got some of the U.S. Geological Survey satellite maps and drilled down to identify where is the agricultural land and how much of your land cover is agriculture versus developed land pretty darn stable. These are the most recent data available from satellite USGS survey data. Less than a tenth of a percent change over almost a decade period. Same thing with development in terms of development increasing. Pretty stable for a whole state. So in a way, good job uh, for if you have that goal to keep that pretty stable. And everything else that's not either agriculture or developed land sums to, pretty, to almost exactly stable at 80.9%. Uh, which is basically everything else from wetland, forest, and barren land. Now your transportation statistics, I know one more related issue is transportation. It's a pretty important one when you talk about climate. We talk about this in Smart Growth America, climate is related to transportation. And generally you would like VMT, vehicle miles traveled, to be steady or go down. The trend is that in Vermont, they've been those numbers, VMT, have been pretty steady for about a decade and there's been a dip since the pandemic. This is not surprising. The, the, overall, um, the overall state has about seven to six and a half million billion uh, VMT. So there you have it. But transit use, big hit when you go from 2020, 2020 to 2021, the pandemic period, not like not unlike other states and other metropolitan areas, that is a large hit that you see. We'd like to get that number back up because that's an important part of meeting overall climate goals. So 
So you know, here's your transportation statistics and it's one part to consider. How do those designation programs play in to mode choice, to transportation, to the ability of people to take transit or other transportation modes like walking and biking? So moving away from topical areas, these are the actual findings and some of the key takeaways of the designation program themselves. This is now the program evaluation stuff. And I want to focus part on where we consider the evaluation itself. There's, uh, there's four main takeaways, uh, at least for this short presentation that we have this morning. The program is challenging to coordinate. That's one of the things we really see, some coordination challenges. Uh, we see that local communities have different views than the state overall. So when you talk to state officials and when you talk to local officials, there's some differences in perception, but that's not uncommon to many government programs really anywhere where end users may think differently than uh, administrators. We see that programs are not easy to administer on either of those ends. We heard that the programs are a bit difficult. That's there. And then to the extent that they're difficult or any of these three things exist, there's a difference in this perception of micro versus macro goals. I'm going to get into specifics of that. But that broadly means that at the micro level, some view that, oh, maybe it's meeting success at this small scale development at our municipality at these very local levels. But when you talk about higher statewide goals, this macro stuff, maybe not necessarily a strong belief or view or perception that it's aligned high, uh, very strongly. So getting into some specifics on coordination, uh, here's uh, what coordination looks like. A small view from one of your documents. Um, makes complete sense, right? We, we, we thought so. Um, took about 30 seconds to digest it, right? You got the program? Everyone? Yeah, all right, that's what we thought. So <laughs> what we heard about this type of stuff is that there's some confusion of what the program does. Now look, it's not that surprising given that like many government programs at the federal level, at the state level, really everywhere, it's a multi-layer of five programs. There are five different points at which you added programs to one another. So you have this layer cake of sorts of different programs and that naturally need, uh, leads to some difficult coordination. That's probably why we're here today. So <laughs> with that, we heard um, some mixed views, and this comes from our survey. Participants were mixed to middling about their satisfaction on the designation program, uh, especially if it benefits local goals. Overall, we heard some points on coordination. How does the development, how does development coordinate within the program? Who's tracking anything? Uh, how does infrastructure align with growth? These are just some of the areas. Uh, the main point here is that complexity of the five programs, it evolved over time, it evolved over five different programs that were put together on this, and that naturally creates some challenges for co coordination. Then we have this other issue that we're seeing of local versus statewide perceptions. We heard some differences from local officials, again, from folks at states, and this isn't surprising, nor an, nor an indictment of local officials or statewide officials. Again, it's a nature of many programs where end users and administrators might just have some different perceptions of what's going on. It may, the locals may tend to be a little more critical of programs that they use and weren't necessarily strong on the idea that programs were heavily serving their communities or their particular goals. And back to the idea that programs are difficult here. When you ask very specifically, not high scores per se on overall understanding or overall uh, belief that the program is easy on the one hand or other way, uh, uh, to say it another way, it's a little hard to administer, to comprehend, to execute the program. Uh, there are many points of challenges from creating boundaries to the back and forth between local officials, DHCD and the board. We have challenges of overlapping designations and maintaining them. Uh, folks, the programs simply are not simple. We heard that. We see it in your documents and we see it ourselves in terms of uh, our expertise to such that it is. And in considering a new program framework, we need to think about the program structure, how it can be improved with ease, and how it can be easier for local officials, businesses, developers, and for the state officials who administer the programs themselves. And lastly, this idea of micro versus macro goals. The main point here 
is we noticed that there was a distinction between when you ask, is the program really meeting your goals? Well, which goals? Are we talking about the developer, the local community, the very specific stuff? Are we talking about these big macro, large statewide goals? Maybe on the former, yeah. We could see, for example, that maybe a developer likes the regulatory relief here, or that the tax credits or that some of the transportation credits are doing their thing at this local site level or municipal level. But when you say about statewide goals, you get a shrug. How is it meeting statewide goals? Well, I suppose the documents say it's supposed to. But from an operations point, from a theory of change perspective, how is this program leading to that? There is an indirect path, yes, but views from participants, from folks that we talk to, that maybe that arrow isn't as strong and could be stronger. And so with that, I'll leave it here as a recap, and we'll hear a lot more about these themes the rest of today in this presentation and our workshops. I'm looking forward to putting together a great program evaluation of our findings with our team and all of us at SGA. And we look forward to talking to you folks again or to your legislature. Today is very much part of this process. So now I'll turn it over to Rebecca. I'll have some more fun with actually getting to get your phones out and seeing some of the, um, getting to give us some direct input. And yes, of course we see. Thank you so much, Michael. Welcome, everybody. It is great to be here and see all of you in the room after so many weeks of planning and getting everyone registered. I am going to need a minute for tech transition, and that's a perfect moment to ask you all to make a little tech transition. Michael is actually serious about getting your phones out. We are going to attempt some live polling. We are going to need every warm energy vibe in the room for technology to work, because of course, those gremlins are always here. So if you have a phone on you, pull it out. On your table is an agenda that has Wi-Fi instructions for today. If you do not have a phone on you or any other device, a tablet, a laptop would also work just fine, find a buddy. A key theme for the rest of the day is going to be that it takes a village to do just about anything. Sorry, downtowns. But we're going to have a lot of village energy in the room today. So you can certainly team up with somebody nearby you if you do not have your own phone or if you struggle to understand the technology today. If you struggle to figure out how to get on the Wi-Fi, find a buddy near you who can help you out. We'll have our first team challenge this year to see uh, which table can get on first. And then I'm going to just switch over and get our polling set up. If somebody is really struggling, wave a hand in the air and hopefully one of our resource team members who particularly gets tech will be able to come around and help you out or somebody else. And if you have gotten yourself connected so far, you can also just stay on your cell signal if you like, but Wi-Fi may be a little bit better. You can go ahead and take a look at the screen and get connected to our polling system here today. There are three ways you can do that. You can scan that QR code by holding your phone right up, opening your camera and snapping it, and that will let you open the link. It's not, showing. it's not showing. Oh dear, look at that. Okay, let's try this again. Hmm. Thank you for that. Oh. 
Okay, we have more tech challenges than I thought. <laughs> Sit tight for a second. Set up as an extended display, you need to interact with It was working just fine a minute ago at PowerPoint. All right, I'm going to give you all a challenge here for a moment while we're figuring this out. If you've figured out your Wi-Fi, here's your first challenge to discuss at the table. What is one thing that surprised you out of what you just heard Michael presenting? So just go around. You can start by introducing yourselves to your table members if you want to do that. Names, pronouns, organization, or where you're from. Something that surprised you while we got our display set up. <laughs> 